May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. This is one of those Sundays where no one in our gospel comes off looking particularly good, disciples or Jesus. Did you notice? The disciples and Jesus are traveling, and Luke has this great turn of phrase, remember it, Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. Now before this gospel, but in the same continuing line of story, the disciples have been on a roll, uh, and by a roll, imagine the cartoonish kind where someone has fallen down the steep side of a hill and is careening uncontrollably down head over heels. A few verses before our reading today is their argument uh, about who is the greatest. You know the one, right? Now, don't be too quick to judge the disciples. These guys are getting some glimpse of the truth of how powerful Jesus is. They're on the right side of history. Eleven of them are, you know. When Jesus asked what, was, what must be given up to be a part of God's work in the world, they answered valiantly and came to Jesus' side. But no motivation is pure, is it? Something else wriggles in the dark corners of our hearts. The disciples argue about who will get the highest honor. And to answer them, you know the story, Jesus invites a child uh, to his side. and says, look at this. The weak, the inconsequential, the ones who can't vote or levy power or pay taxes or smoke. Your welcome of them in my name is the measure of your greatness. It's a really sweet sentiment. Maybe even sweeter for those of us who, like me or Jesus, and have never spent time actually raising children. I read this and thought about visiting my seven-month-old niece this past week, uh, who I think is perfect, by the way, and but looking at my sister, her mother's eyes, and finding these sort of stunning black circles uh, underneath of them, and this accompanying look of exhausted defeat. She's a demon, my sister stated forlornly. <laughs> As her equally exhausted seven-month-old screamed at regular intervals in order to keep herself from falling asleep. This is the kingdom. Unsettling for those of us with power and control and advanced degrees who pay taxes and can smoke. Jesus lifting up this irrational, helpless thing instead of his overachieving friends, as if to ask, why are you in rivalry with one another? And this little band, they keep walking, that now they're in an embarrassed silence. You can tell because James blushes really easily. Their ambition was recognized by their leader and then disparaged. So John tries to recover some ground here. He tries to pass the buck. Well, he says, we saw a guy back there who wasn't even called by you. He was casting out demons in your name. We told him to knock it off. Can you believe the audacity, the presumption of that guy? What does he know about our work? Jesus stops again. Why did you do that? Don't you know that whoever is not against you is for you, he says. Why are you tearing other people down? This one with the impure motives, the one trying to get in on the movement who has no place there, the one deluding the message, he's in too. These people are not your competition. Why? Are you in rivalry with them? Which brings us to our gospel today. Jesus sends messengers on ahead, and knowing the prequel, maybe it's a nice way of saying he's fed up with their company for now. And the disciples entered a, a village of Samaritans, strangers who aren't even pretending to follow Jesus, strangers who had it clearly wrong, and who were actually against them and their beliefs. John and James seize their chance. 
they rush to Jesus breathlessly and say, how about we call down fire from heaven and consume them? Well, let's pause in our chapter of the disciples' terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day for a clarifying interlude here because it's important to understand that John and James are speaking biblically here. They are following Scripture to a T. Who do people think Jesus is? Also, in Luke chapter 9, we back up just a little bit. I do kind of hate that I can't tell you to pull out your Bibles like my old evangelical pastors did. Everyone go to Luke chapter 9 and look at this. But you know the story. The disciple, Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? And what, they, what do they answer? The disciples Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, right? Why do they think that? We have our answer, or at least answers for us, in this Old Testament reading. Elijah, the greatest prophet next to Moses, never died. He was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind and fire, and Jews await his return to this day. So what was Elijah famous for? calling down fire from heaven on his enemies. Scott told you last week the story of the 850 prophets of Baal. It's a Sunday school classic. We all know the fire came and consumed Elijah's offering and even the water that was filling the trenches all around it. But Sunday school and our lectionary edits out the grislier detail that Elijah then slaughtered each of the 850 rivals of his with a sword, and he walks away splattered and stained with the blood of nearly a thousand people and crawls into the cave and into a deep depression. Take away my life, Lord, he prays, for I am no better than my ancestors. The power he could wield to stop his enemies and his rivals has left him empty. The story of Elijah is a story of faith deconstructing. His will to live seems to deconstruct right along with it. Maybe you know that feeling. He disappears from public life after that story last week to return only one more time at God's behest to tell the king that he's going to die because of his idolatry. And the king wants more information and he sends a troop of 50 to find Elijah and bring him to the palace and Elijah sees them and calls down fire from heaven and incinerates the 50. The king sends another 50. The same thing happens, same results. Finally, one captain comes groveling on his knees and he is spared the fire. But that's it. That's the end of Elijah. The next we see is in our reading today, when he really is actually done with this life. I read Elijah not with a tone of triumph, but of pathos. The man himself consumed in those flames and power which he once commanded. Maybe you know that feeling too. Centuries later, the Jewish people await Elijah's return. John and James and others see that power in Jesus, but have not yet learned what Jesus has, that those who live by the flames perish by them, that Jesus will be in rivalry with no one. Rivalry was natural in my competitive family. It is natural. My dad boasted last week when we sat down to play Trivial Pursuit, I've never lost at this game nor any game that I have ever played. (laughs) Second place is first loser is the closest thing we have to a family motto. I've heard it all my life. Not actually helpful. You and I live in a world where competition and enemy are pretty much synonymous terms. We can bring down fire from heaven on any one of them with the push of a button. 
the sacrificial shedding of other people's blood, so the story of humankind goes, is what ensures our freedom. Financial security, they say, is thanks to competition on the free market. We spend our time wondering about the powerful and our proximity to them. Who will be at your right hand, O oh Lord? And as our polarization deepens, we hear that voices who do not proclaim with purity the given doctrine are to be rebuked and silenced. When we seriously read the Bible, we see that our realities are just old systems, cranking out the same rivalries, comparisons, insider, outsider, winner, loser narratives all throughout time. But remember what Luke says. Jesus has his face turned away from these things. His face is turned toward Jerusalem. We know what happens there. Will you follow him there? It's a hard road. It upsets these orders we've been given, Jesus says. He tells us that fan friends and family will find your change of mind alarming. But who knows? Maybe you have felt like this already, like Elijah. That the things that you could trust that once held purpose and meaning have gone up in flames. Maybe in that loss, you are closer to the kingdom than you think. It's through the ashes on the other side that Jesus finds life. <laughs>